The Mac Observer's Mac Geek App, episode 806 for Monday, March 16th, 2020. Good readings, folks, and welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all your questions and your tips, you know, your cool stuff found, our cool stuff found. With the things that we've learned, we mix them all together and we put them into an agenda. The goal of which is that when we get to the when we, easy for me to say, when we get together every week, we each learn at least five new things. We're all in this together. Sponsors for this week's episode include Linode.com slash MGG, Jamf.com slash MGG. They're back very happily. Uh, LegalZoom.com and BareBones.com. We'll talk more in detail about those a little bit later. But for now, here in Durham, New Hampshire, probably to stay for a little while. No South by Southwest for me. I'm Dave Hamilton. Yes, and here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Braun. Uh, you know what? Let's dive right in because D- Andrew's question is one that has come up in a variety of different ways. And I think we have a new way to approach it. Andrew wrote in and asked us, he said, I'm looking for a multi port USB C hub or dock, whatever you want to call it. And I have been unable to find anything of the sort. Do you know of a high quality one? I have many USB C devices that do not have secondary USB C ports that I could use to daisy chain. So the reality is these things don't exist. And we've talked about this on the show before, but this time I took a slightly different approach. And what I did was I said, well, what do you want to do? Like, what's the reason that you need all these extra USB C ports? Because right now in our, in our worlds, you know, it's dongle world, right? You have USB-C and that allows us either with the USB protocol or the Thunderbolt protocol to get and add other devices like, you know, USB-A ports or Ethernet or HDMI or, you know, whatever we need, drives, you name it. And and he said, yeah, he said, um, he, he said, uh, let, me, let me read exactly. He says, the issue is that uh, using SSBC, SSDs with USB-C, I have multiple drives that I want to add because going larger than one terabyte with any one SSD is super expensive. So it, in order to have lots of storage hanging off my Mac, I need lots of individual USB-C SSDs that are going to hang off my Mac. And I'm like, OK, right. That makes sense. And here's the problem with that. If you got a USB-C hub and hung all of these, you know, SSDs off it, where's the power going to come from? And and we're going to revisit this a little bit later in the show, too. There's going to be a theme here today. But a USB-C hub, how does it know? How, like, your Mac can only provide so much power across the bus. And USB-C is built to deliver power, right? And potentially lots of power. So how do you deal with this? And this is why these devices don't exist, because it's impossible to predict what someone is going to choose to plug in. So you need to limit the number of USB-C ports so that you can manage power effectively. And in this case, that's especially true because SSDs are among the most uh, power consuming highest, uh, not most highest power consuming devices that you can attach. Right. And it's even more so if it's say an NVMe drive on a Thunderbolt bus, right? Because those are require more power and they're also like way, way faster. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that. We, we're revisiting that, that issue that I saw on the MacBook air and, and others uh, a little bit later in the show. But um, so to solve this problem, he's right. If you want SSDs or really any storage, you know, you, you, you'll, you'll probably want multiple drives. And so I started thinking, well, why not a JBOD, right? We've talked about this before many times. 
some single device that you attach to your Mac, either with Thunderbolt or USB, and they exist in both ways. And then you can put all of your drives in that. Now you don't have to pay for all the extra cases for those drives, the enclosures for those drives, because essentially what a JBot is, is it's an enclosure for multiple drives. And then you can sort of do with it whatever you want. And, you know, the, the Thunderbolt one that always comes up, of course, is Otherworld Computing's Thunder Bay. They've got their four bay for, I think, 395 bucks or something. Um, and that's, uh, you know, four bay thing. It's got Thunderbolt three. So it can do 40 gigabits per second and all that good stuff, which is great. But there are USB uh, JBOD enclosures that you can use. I've never used them, so I can't really speak to their. Um, you know, uh, effectiveness or reliability, but you know, Orico is a brand that makes a couple of them. They've, um, uh, they've got, uh, you know, that we'll put links in the show notes and Sabrent is another brand that, I mean, we've used some of their stuff in the past and it's proven to be fairly reliable. And, you know, you can get a five bay, uh, one for about 200 bucks. You can get a, the Sabrent, the Sabrent one I found is so the, the Orico one that I found, and I'll put a link in the show notes is five gigabits per second. So USB three point whatever gen one. And then uh, there is a 10 gigabits per second one for 180 bucks from Sabrent. That's a four bay. But, you know, if you want the additional speed, then that's great. So we'll put links to all of these in the show notes. But but I think that's that's a that's perhaps the right way to think about this is when you when you find yourself in a scenario where you need to or want to attach multiple USB-C devices, uh, zoom out a little bit and ask what are those devices and what's what, what are the multiple ways that I could solve this problem? Because in this case, a JBOD, you know, especially for like 200 bucks that, you know, that starts to really change the, the nature of how this is going to go. That's, those are my thoughts. What do you, what do you think, Mr. Braun? <sighs> I'm actually with you on that. Now, at first I was asking myself the question, well, why not just get a powered USB-C hub? Just like I had up until recently, I had a you know, USB 3 uh, right. powered hub. Right. And I could plug as many things in there as I want. But because the power requirements were modest in that world. And predictable. Mm -hmm. Right. Mo modest. But you're right. Yeah. Modest is is the key there. They They, they couldn't be... Uh, you know, 15 watts or something, which these certainly can. So, yeah. 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 I don't know. I think it's, I, I think this would be the way to go, but well, mm -hmm. yeah, it's one way to go. So, yeah. Uh, but I'll put, uh, I'll put these links in the show notes so that we've got some, some things to learn from. It's good. That's good. All right. Uh, let's see. Drake, right? We're we moving on to Drake, John. Yes. yes? Okay, yes. cool. Uh, Drake asks, he says, I have custom keyboard shortcuts set up via system preferences, keyboard shortcuts, app shortcuts. This is where you can go and add key, like command key, like, you know, like command P to print, uh, you can add those types of shortcuts to any menu command, and this is where you would do it. System preferences, keyboard shortcuts, and then app shortcuts. Then you can set them per app or, uh, you know, system-wide, and it's a really handy thing. Uh, he says, when I first learned about this, it was very much a cool stuff found, So I, and I agree. So there you go. There's a, there's a little cool stuff found that you can do this. He says, however, I now work between my MacBook Pro and Mac Mini and have been looking for a way to sync these custom keyboard shortcuts between my Macs. But despite countless Google and forum searches, I have come up empty. So I ask you, my fellow Mac geeks, do you know of a way to sync these keyboard shortcuts? Or maybe is this a geek challenge? Sadly, I think it's the latter. I, I like your thoughts, especially, you know, if your fingers get used to doing a thing a certain way, you kind of want that on all of your main devices. But... I haven't found a way to sync these, John. Have you any any thoughts from you before we before we just leave it as a uh, as a as a geek challenge? Um, yeah, when I was researching this one, I mean, this 
doing this on iOS isn't really a bit. Uh, iOS seems to be able to pull this off, but Mac OS cannot. Especially uh, if you have, uh, John, I, I iOS you have doesn't, iCloud enabled. iOS doesn't have a keyboard shortcut thing. What What are you talking about with iOS? Hold on. Okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't think that's what you mean. There's no keyboard on iOS, so there's nothing to sync. There's no shortcuts. I mean, there are. Actually, that's not true. There, there, you can use a lot of sort of your normal Mac app keyboard shortcuts. If you attach a keyboard to, to iOS, like a physical keyboard that has a command key, when you're in mail and you finish typing a message, if you do command shift D, boom. It will send that email. You know, all of those things exist. But but in iOS, there's no way to customize them. Uh, at least in Mac OS, we can customize, but we can't sync from Mac to Mac. Uh, OK, no, I, I know the problem here. The problem is that the Apple's naming convention is, is kind of confusing. Um, text replacements will. Agreed. Yes. And text sync. replacements will sync amongst, well, in theory, they will sync to all of your iCloud devices, Macs and iOS uh, devices the same. But yeah, the the um, yeah, yeah you, I agree with you. Apple's naming on this. It, it, they missed it, they shortcuts has been a thing for a very long time. And so that's why it continues to be named shortcuts. But I'm with you. The shortcuts is a better term for text replacements, but that's a different thing. So unfortunately, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Um, in the, uh, in the pre-show when we were talking about this, you know, you, you asked, could, um, could keyboard maestro do this? And the answer is sort of, um, this isn't really what keyboard maestro is built to do, but it could do it. Um, it, it, you know, with keyboard maestro, you could build, you build macros and macros can go and trigger menu items and you can assign a keystroke to macros. So tying it all together Yes, you could do this. And yes, you can sync your keyboard maestro macros amongst all of your Macs. So that would be one way to do it. It's not syncing these. It's not, you know, the the nice native to the OS experience of these types of command keys. But in theory, I suppose keyboard maestro could do this. That'd be that's one way. I don't know. I don't know. Right. Yeah, I, I saw it suggested in a. Uh article i was trying to solve this yeah but I, that may be the only solution um I, you know i mean there there might be nothing else right so i don't know well i don't know uh anything more on this one john no no okay mm. let's move so, yes let's go to chris okay go take us yes please all right let me get up here. All right. So Chris had a, a head scratcher here. Ah, uh, long time listener. I'm at a dead end thinking about next steps for troubleshooting. I'm running on an early 2015 13 inch Retina MacBook Pro, seemingly out of nowhere, but possibly with the 1015 10.15.3 update and external USB super drive stop mounting disks, audio, and other data types. The disk spins up, but it doesn't mount. I experimented with different USB ports, different external drives, SMC repit, reset, and VRAM. Now I've realized it's more than just mounting drives because a CAC card reader also doesn't work. I've applied the latest combo updater. USB thumb drives do mount properly as does external spinning hard drives and the SD card reader mounts properly. The super drives as well as the CAC reader both show up in the USB system information when connected. Screenshot attached. Uh, and he has boot camp partition and the super drive mounts properly in windows aha all right well that's a that's a clue yeah but chris actually found the answer didn't he? And, and he shared it back with us didn't he yes so my speculation i was like uh, sounds like it may be a driver thing i don't know and i think i was kind of right <laughs> depending on how you wanted to find a driver um All right. But um, yeah, he wrote back. And uh, so, so, you know, I threw a couple of suggestions and I guess he tried some of them. 
It turns out I was combating two issues that are both Catalina related. Catalina no longer reads HF, HFS formatted media, only HFS plus. This was causing my disk reading problems. The disk mounted in Windows because it was partitioned with the same data in some Windows format. Aha. The confounding issue and why I thought I had some greater USB problems was that the smart card wasn't working either. It turns out that was also Catalina. It used to be that the built-in Mac OS smart card solution didn't work for my purposes. Well, now it does with Catalina. At the same time, Catalina permanently disabled my third-party smart card implementation. Uh, all very confusing. Huh. So Catalina stops reading HFS disks and only reads HFS plus and APFS, of course. So does that mean that Catalina is non plussed by HFS or is that just a really bad twist on words? Ah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's a good one. <laughs> um, I guess. Yeah. Now, I the one thing, the one thing I was kicking around with you here, I don't know if this would be a, a potential solution. So there's something called Mac fuse that lets you read other file systems. Okay. But as we dug into it, it looks like uh, that there is an HFS plugin that'll work with this, but it hasn't been touched in years. So I think you may have the same problem. Got it. Got it. Yeah. So there's no way to add HFS support back to the Mac, that, which makes sense. I mean, why up until now it was unnecessary and other than some lingering old drives that were not hfs plus i mean how long what hfs plus is like that is 20 years old isn't it like hfs plus mm -hmm. was from i'm looking here in uh january 19th 1998 so 21 years old now if i'm doing no 22 years old now doing my math uh, correctly so, uh, yeah, and then, it, so HFS was prior to that for how long? Um, yeah, okay. And yeah, HFS was in 85. So it, it, HFS didn't exist all that long on its own. It was, well, I guess that is, I mean, that's, what, 14 years. And so, um, yeah, okay. Well, before that, you had MFS. Right, right. I do, uh, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So, so, but this is a good, I mean, this is a good little heads up for everybody. Make sure it, that all your, and this is probably just zooming out a little bit. This is a good thing to do in general is if you've got data on, you know, sort of archived data, read that once a year, take a, take an afternoon, a Saturday afternoon and just go through it all and make sure that your current computer can read that data because if you this it let's say you had some stuff that was hfs and you never really thought about it and then you know this year you go and you plug it into your thing and you're like oh uh oh it doesn't read that well at least like today it wouldn't be all that difficult to find a mojave machine that could read these things and and then you can migrate the data to a newer format or whatever but if you waited 10 years and realized, oh, I can't read HFS anymore. But that's a problem. You're going to have a real issue, you know, trying to create a machine, especially if it's in the moment that you need or want to get to that data. Now you're in sort of a time crunch, potentially, and trying to solve this, you know, ancient tech problem is essentially what it would become at that time. So this is the and and also doing that confirms that your media is still working you know your data is in good shape etc cetera, etc cetera. so yeah yeah all right good i like it i like yeah. it. yeah and then the smart card thing i guess it was the driver was never updated <clears throat> right okay well but the, it, oh is okay so two separate things the 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 driver for the actual reader was never upgraded is that is that what chris was saying I think that's it, because if you, if you go into system info software extensions, there's a column that I don't think was there before. And I think it says notarized or something. I think you got to yeah. specially sign. A, a driver has to be specially signed or else it's it's not going to work. Got it. Um, got it. OK. And yeah, I think that's a problem with a lot of uh, with a lot of uh, 
older stuff is that, you know, if the developer abandons it, well, too bad. Yeah. If it's not up to updated for Catalina, then you've got to it may never work or you might have to do some some rejiggering to make it work. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Yeah. So HFS formatted partitions no longer work in Catalina and smart card CAC users must use native CAC services in Catalina. If you'd been using a third party solution that would involve removing the old solution and re-enabling the native solution. So, yeah, cool. Thank you for that, Chris. Great, great stuff. I have we have two quick tips and and John, I will remind you that these are quick. So the first one is a thing that I shared with a staff member the other day. I have I run FileMaker and I connect to a remote database and every time my machine goes to sleep, it loses. It drops that connection to that database. I have to reestablish it. So I've started using uh one of the many pieces of software I'm using one called amphetamine. Uh, it's available for free, which is why I'm using it. But uh, that, that leverages Mac OS's caffeinate terminal command to, but you don't have to use the terminal to keep my Mac awake. And it's awesome because I just set it when I'm get to my desk and I launch FileMaker, I turn on amphetamine for eight hours and now my screen can go to sleep and all of that stuff. But if I leave to go get like a quick snack or something like that, or I get a phone call, I can come back to my desk and I haven't lost my FileMaker connection. It is fantastic. So I highly recommend if you're thinking as soon as I mentioned this in, in one of our meetings, everybody there was like, wait a minute, I could use that for this reason or that reason. So thinking about, you know, when you're sort of having a long stretch of work, uh, it might be worthwhile to tell your Mac, yeah, for, you know, the next whatever, two hours, four hours, eight hours, whatever it's going to be, don't sleep. Super handy. So amphetamine, that's my quick tip. It's, I know it's a cool stuff found, but the use case is the quick tip. So and then, John, you found one. We found one this morning prepping for the show. John. Yeah. Um, yes, I'm here. Hey. And uh, yeah, I ran into this last week. I was trying to read something that, that you had uh, put in uh, Evernote and the color was terrible. It was like this light blue against uh, white and I, it was just really hard to read. Um, the quick tip here is mail preferences, font and color fonts and colors. And there's going to be a choice color quoted text. Um, Pick something else. Uh, you, we picked something else. Um, th their choice of teal, I don't think, is that great. So, I agree. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. It's just a light color and a light background. Just uh, no. So uh, I don't think they made a good choice. Or you could just uncheck that box and then all the text will be whatever your normal text color is. Right. So. And this is it, it, this isn't an Evernote thing. It's a it. What we do is we read PDFs of your emails here. So if you're making PDFs with mail or printing with mail uh, to a color printer, this is where these colors actually matter. They also appear on screen when you're viewing mail, too. So uh, perhaps forget about PDFs, maybe just on screen. It's even better for you, too. So, yeah, sweet. Good stuff. I like it. Uh I want to take a minute and talk about our uh, first two sponsors, if that's OK with you, my friend, Mr. Braun. Yes. All right. Look, taxes, right? That's one thing we all have to deal with this time of year. And if you're a business owner like I am or just, you know, somebody with a family and things like that get a little complex going on, it's critical to know all your options. And this is where LegalZoom is here for all of us to lean on. They have a ton of resources to help, including, and this might even be the best part, their network of independent attorneys and tax professionals, right, that are there to provide the advice that we need to ensure we're operating our businesses and our lives the way that we want to. And since LegalZoom isn't a law firm, you'll save time and money while avoiding hourly fees. They have these legal plans where you can have 30 minute consultations about things. So you're not worried about, oh, crap, like I got to go and do this thing. And no, that it it's it just works. And the pricing starts as low as nine ninety nine a month for a personal plan and, and business plans are as low as thirty one twenty five a month. So these are affordable numbers that make it so that you're not afraid to go get those questions answered, that it would be really nice 
to have an attorney help you with. We had some stuff going on and we've always got stuff going on with the businesses and we've had some stuff going on with the family that just, you know, these things that sort of normally come up and being able to tap into this network is awesome, right? So if if, whatever you need, this is a good place to start because you can really get that advice without being worried about, oh my gosh, what am I racking up here? All of that good stuff. So you got to check it out. Go to LegalZoom.com today to get your business and your family on the right track for 2020. LegalZoom, where life meets legal. Linode, that's our next sponsor, and it's one I'm really happy to have. Happy to have them as a sponsor, but I'm also happy to have them as a service. Linode is here to give you the server that you need for your business, for your family, for the fun stuff you do, whatever you need, Linode is there because they've been doing this since 2003. They've got over 800,000 customers. They're a hundred percent independent. They are the largest independent cloud for developers, believe it or not. So this is the place to go. And what's cool is everything they do is based on SSDs, right? We know here SSDs are fast. We talk about it all the time. Not an episode goes by where something about the speed benefits of SSDs isn't included. And here we are again. Everything, even their $5 a month nanode server runs on SSDs. And I've got a deal where you can get a $20 credit to start. So that means you get four months for free. But they also nowadays are offering, for a limited time, free migration to Linode. Linode Professional Services does a free cloud migration of your business workload so that you can get migrated to Linode. So go check this out. Go to Linode.com, L-I-N-O-D-E.com slash M-G-G for your $20 credit to get started. Thanks to Linode for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, it's time for some follow-ups for um, previous episodes. And we'll start with Allison. Uh, In show 804, we were talking to listener Chris And he asked about whether he should learn Apple script to work with automator. And Allison says, I'm not sure I'd recommend that now that Apple will let you use JavaScript inside automator. She says it breaks my heart because I know how beloved Apple script is, but it doesn't seem like it's the future. She says, I took the class Ray Robertson taught at command D and loved it, but I think it's heyday is over. If you already know Apple script, like I know many of you do, then of course go for it. But I think for someone new, it's maybe not the best place to start in 2020. She says uh, Bart Bouchotts did a thing on this just last week for Allison's chit chat across the pond where uh, Bart showed some very simple examples of using JavaScript inside of Automator to quick to make quick actions uh, to modify text with services. And he's rewritten all of his scripts from using Perl to JavaScript for now. So we'll put a link to to that uh, little segment there that Allison mentioned from from her show from No Silicast. But um, but yeah, it, I, I'm with I'm with you, Allison. It it pains me too, but I think with Apple's direction aiming towards shortcuts and that sort of thing. Honestly, I'm not even sure that Automator has uh, a long future either. But certainly Apple script is, I think, I think saying that it's heyday is over and probably not the right thing to start anew with in 2020. I think you're probably right. As, as sad as that is uh, now with Salsa Goyen gone from Apple, uh, he was a- Apple script was as I understand the lore. And this is not anything confidential, but as I understand uh, without Sal at Apple, Apple script probably would have been canceled a very long time ago. So uh, I think now that, you know, Sal has been gone for a couple of years from Apple. I mean, he's still in the community and he's still a fantastic resource in the community. But uh, but now that he's not at Apple to kind of, you know, twist arms and, and do all the things that Sal does. I don't know that he ever actually twisted someone's arm. That, that, that was meant to be a figure of speech. If you know differently, perhaps just keep that to yourself. Uh, but um, but yeah, I think you're right, Allison. JavaScript that it, way more widespread uh, use to as well if if um, you know once you've learned javascript you know for the mac now it sort of applies in in 
on the web and in many, many, many other places. So thank you for that. Good stuff, Allison. Thoughts, Mr. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the good news is you can do both with an automator, Dave. So. Correct. Yeah, because I just found the help article in Automator and it says, oh, in addition to Apple Script, Automator supports JavaScript for automation. Hooray. Well, well so, that's what she was saying. She said Bart mm. Bart used JavaScript inside of Automator to do ah, all of these things. And then yeah. he redid it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's a good thing. Yeah, it is. Uh, from show 805, we you which is last week's show, John, you were talking about uh, how you could not get your sensor to or your iStat I menus to show you your ambient light, I think is what it was. And uh, Mark from Bajango, the company that makes iStat menus, listened to the segment and wrote in. He says on that 16 inch MacBook Pro, as it stands, we don't think we have a way to show info from the True Tone sensor. Uh, if we find a way, he says we will add support. So so there's that. And then also in that episode, uh, he says, I do have a bit of a correction. Sometimes, he says, we update the version on our website prior to making the update available to everyone built via the built-in update checker. And he says this is for two reasons. Number one, to stage the rollout of updates so we can be absolutely sure we have a solid release by letting people that want to download it, you know, sort of manually from the website get it first. Uh, if there's a problem, it hasn't now just been pushed out to everybody that's got the app. That's not a bad thing. Uh, and number two, he says to be able to fix bugs and provide a quick turnaround for customers that are experiencing issues, they don't have to wait for the next update. We can often just give them a link to the new build. So he says uh, currently the version and this was as of uh, six days before the show was released. So it's possible that, that this has changed. But he says as of that moment, the version that you can download from the website has the 16 inch MacBook Pro and AirPods Pro support, but they have not pushed that update to customers yet. So, John, you may just want to make sure that you get the version from the website so that you have full support for the MacBook Pro. Although, as he noted, it still won't have support for the True Tone sensor because they can't, uh, they have not found a way to read from that yet. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And the way I found is I think the uh, person who pointed this problem out to us and, and I confirmed is that you, yeah, you download it again. Otherwise, you just see one sensor. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. All right, cool. And then also from 805, we were talking about what to do to get service if you're traveling to Europe, uh, once we're able to travel to Europe again. And Darius wrote in and says, perhaps I could add my two cents or two pence uh, to Kevin's question, Darius from the UK says, if I were in his shoes, I'd buy an O2 SIM for one pound and then top it up uh, by a bundle with unlimited calls, unlimited text and a data allowance. He says there's a 15 pound bundle that gives six gigs or a 20 pound bundle that gives 10 gigs. Top up is easy via mobile or online using my O2. And he gave us some links to share. Uh, he says for as long as the UK is still in the EU, you can use the same SIM and plan across the whole of the EU under free roaming. He says, so if you travel with the phone to France, for example, you won't incur roaming charges. He says this will unfortunately cease next year when all of that changes. Uh, he says, additionally, using O2, a nice feature whilst in London, O2 provides free Wi-Fi on the London Underground as well. And he says, so they're on Wi-Fi. I would use FaceTime or WhatsApp to call abroad. So, yeah, great. Thank you for that, Darius. Great advice. Always like to have current stuff, which is uh, which is how it's, that's, that's what we do here. So, sweet. Thank you. Thoughts on that before we move on to Scott here, John? No. Okay. Scott, we talked in 802 about troubleshooting networks, and Scott has some sort of, well, will Scott tell us? Hey, John and Dave, this is Scott. Um, I know I'm a little behind. I'm listening to number 802, so if there's a solution found, you could ignore this. On the uh, ch checking for speed, internet-related speed, some of the things that uh, whoever it is needs to check is um, a number of things can get in the way. First of all, if you have a, a, a a smart hub or a dumb hub or hub of any type, you may want to check the hub to make sure that it's working properly. Take out the hub. I've had hubs go bad for some whatever reason. Even if you reset reset it, 
uh, make sure that that there's nothing wrong with it. For some reason, these things seem to go bad. I don't know. Same thing with cables. You have to check cables. In fact, one of the issues I have found in dealing with particularly Comcast on, on the cable-related issue is certain noise that can come across cable. That's why cables are rated the way they are. Make sure you're using a minimum of CAT 5E uh, for the cable. Otherwise, sometimes for higher speeds, you get a little extra noise bouncing around in there, and that tends to, to mess up uh, uh, switches, routers, whatever is also in the way. So it's, it's check the switches, check the, uh, the cabling also. And if that's not, if that's not the case, then do, uh, for Mac, a full, uh, SMC reset. Um, what is that? That's command to PR when you, when you boot the system. That's the, uh, PRAM reset. I don't know why. I don't know what's in there. But one time I did that on a Mac and it opened things up. I would do that as the last choice. I would do the cable, the, uh, the switches and the routers first, and then uh, reboot and do the uh, uh, command PR last. Those are the things that I found. If that's not it, then it could also be internal to the cable modem, and that's a whole other story. Otherwise, I have nothing else for you guys. Sorry. Bye. Bye. Uh, and uh, don't get caught. Oh, yeah. Good advice. Thank you, Scott. Good stuff. Um, yeah, a couple of things about that. N- number one, it bad hubs. What a great or bad switches, I guess, is what we're using these days for the most part. If you're still using a, a hub for Ethernet switch, change that over to a switch. Way more efficient. But um, I have had I have seen hubs or switches go bad probably more frequently than I've seen cables go bad. These things, they, you know, they, they, they operated a pretty, uh, pretty hot environment. Like just, you know, having all that, that whatever, whatever circuitry is in those things tends to heat up, even if they're not providing power over ethernet or anything, if they are, then especially so, but um, yeah. So it, think about that. If you are having internal network issues, uh, you may well have a bad hub. And then in terms of, the uh, SMC reset, that's actually done a little bit differently. That's not, well, depending on your machine, it might require holding down some keys or it might just be unplug and leave it on, like on a desktop. It's unplugged for 15 seconds, plug back in, wait five more seconds, then turn it on. That does it on a desktop. On laptops, you have to hold down some keys and it depends on which laptop. We'll put an article to that. The command option PR that he mentioned is also a good reset that resets your NVRAM, or we used to call it the PRAM, which is why it's command option PR uh, at you do that while the Mac is booting up right. As soon as you hear the startup chime, you hold those down. You wait until you hear the startup chime again or until the Mac just reboots again. If you don't have startup chime on your Mac and then you move on. So thank you for that, Scott. Any uh, any thoughts from you, Mr. Braun? Yes, we um, we weren't able to get to this question, I think, in a prior episode, but I just dug it up here. Um, in that same vein, uh, listener Michael identified an issue that was causing his network to run slow. Okay. You'll never guess what it is. Well, I'll tell you what it was. At some point, he bought a, a wall socket that had um, uh, spike protection, I guess. Well, apparently uh, sockets can degrade over time. And that was it. Apparently it, w- it degraded to the point where it was introducing noise into the power line and that was freaking out his equipment. So Really? Man. Yeah. Like all the play. How did he find that? Like good, good catch. He, he, he backtraced all the way back to, okay, I replaced that. I replaced that. It's like, well, how about where you're plugging it into? Oh, <clears throat> that sucks. I mean, you know, it, I check, it, like it's another great, thing could be, man. Oh, yeah. Another thing could be a bad ground or polarity. So I actually got one of these. You you should be able to get one of these at, at um, Home Depot or, or any, uh, you know, uh, store that sells electrical stuff. Sure. But um, it tells you if your ground is good and if your polarity is correct. That could also be another cause kind of related to what he said. 
If you can find a link for one of those on like Amazon or something that that's more universal, uh, please put that in the show notes so that people know what specifically you're talking about and what time. I just want, mm-hmm. you know, an example of one of those. That would be great. Oh, man. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. What a good find by Michael. I don't I don't know how long it would take me to decide that that might be my issue. I mean, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's hard to say, right. Cause I, I haven't done any of those things, but man, I would, it, that is not something I, I take it for granted that power from the wall is not going to be the thing sort of messing with my, uh, my environment, or at least I took it for granted. Now I won't anymore thanks to Michael, which is good. So, okay. Yeah. I found one here for uh, seven bucks, which I think is what I found. Yeah. So it checks uh, your polarity, uh, ground fault, um, status. Great. Could be another thing. All right. Awesome. So, yeah. Put that there. in the show notes and we'll all go, we'll all, we'll all just go buy it because I, I, I know I will. So there you go. While we're at it in the last episode, I uh, included as cool stuff found the one what yet another and I've got one more coming in this episode too. Uh, yet another Thunderbolt SSD that uh, Thunderbolt three SSD as we're kind of, you know, exploring these and learning about them. And Walter pointed out the one that I I, I uh, mentioned last week was uh, other world computing's Envoy Pro EX. And Walter said, uh, a big note about the Envoy Pro PEX, it is not compatible with the 2018 Mac Mini. He says, I found this out the less than easy way. Uh, it is mentioned on Otherworld Computing's webpage in the compatibility specs section. Uh, but he says, uh, being that both the Envoy Pro EX and the 2018 Mac Mini are relatively bleeding edge, I was surprised at the incompatibility. And I know that you guys have... Uh, these new Mac minis, which is true. So I thought it might be worth a mention. You are absolutely right, Walter. It's worth more than a mention. It's worth some digging. And so I did that. And I checked in with our friends at Otherworld Computing to find out why. I figured if they're acknowledging this on their website, they probably, I mean, it's OWC. They have the answer. I have the answer because they shared it. And they say the problem stems from a conflict with the Wi Fi chipset. If Wi-Fi is disabled on the Mac Mini, then the drive works fine. Not an ideal solution, but it is a workaround. So I set about testing this because for two reasons. One, I was just curious. I wanted to see how it, it, it behaved and failed. But I also wanted to make sure I saw how it failed because Otherworld Computing is great about testing their own stuff and being very forthcoming with that information. I'm not so sure about every other vendor that that we're talking about here. And so I wanted to see how the OWC drive failed and what it looked like when it failed and how quickly and how frequently and all of that stuff so that I could do that same test with all these others. And uh, and it fails pretty quickly, at least in our experience. You plug the drive in, it mounts, you can do speed, you know, tests on the drive, whatever. It's happy, good to go within about certainly less than 10 minutes. Uh, it falls offline. You get the you get the little notice that says you should have ejected the drive properly. But by the time that notice comes up, the drive has remounted. So it's a very quick reset that happens. And and then the drive is there again. Of course, it's completely non-optimal and really not the right way to go. If, if this is the kind of thing that you need to do, turning off Wi-Fi eliminates that. But it's a it's a recurring thing. It happens, you know, many times an hour. So it's like, OK, good. We can test these things now. And, and we are and we will. So thank you, Walter. Thank you to OWC for the information. Very, very handy. Good. All right. And now on to that cool stuff found, because uh, I, as I said, I do have another drive to test. And this one does not appear to suffer from this same issue. So they must be using a different chipset as OWC or maybe some shielding or something like that. Um, And that is the G drive mobile pro SSD. Uh, I've been testing the one terabyte version. It's three seventy nine ninety nine. And it gets those, you know, 2000 higher than 2000 megabyte per second writes higher than 2300 megabyte per second reads. It's uh, it, it it's actually it's a really nice looking drive. It, it 
you know, it's that it's that G drive stuff, right? I mean, it's worth looking at the pictures, but it's kind of got some it's a it's a metal enclosure. It's got the fins and in, in between the fins, it's got like a little blue hue kind of going on. Not a light, but just a you know blue reflective kind of hue. Separate uh, Thunderbolt three cable that it comes with. So you could, in theory, use a longer one if you wanted. But it's a you know, I think it's a one meter cable. I think that it comes with if I'm if I'm guessing correctly and uh, nice little drive. And like I said, tests out well. So um, like the like the many of the other ones, it is Thunderbolt three only. It is not it, even though it, it uses a USB port or USB C shaped port. Uh, it is Thunderbolt only. So, you know, it won't work on a on like a MacBook that has USB-C ports that are not Thunderbolt. So, but great little drive. Um, I like this one too. Like I said, we're, we're going through each of these sort of individually and then we'll coalesce them all and, and give you kind of a comparison chart in a couple of weeks here of, of all the, the, you know, the various drives that we've tested and, and all that good stuff. So good. Any, any questions on the um, Mac mini thing, the G drive or whatever. I do want to follow up on our, our Thunderbolt USB connection issue that I started talking about two weeks ago. I've dug very deep into that, John, but, but just oh. wanted to, yeah. Cool. Uh, any, any yeah, questions so. on, on these drives or the Mac mini thing before we move on? Nope. nope. Hmm. So we did mention a couple of weeks ago, uh, the thing that John and I had seen on my MacBook Air while in Las Vegas, and that was that the uh, the order in which I plugged devices into the USB-C ports on my Air mattered. Specifically, if a Thunderbolt drive was plugged in, a Thunderbolt device of any kind, uh, at least from my tests, was plugged in first, the system would see it as a Thunderbolt device. If it was plugged in second, the system would not. Now, I was happened to be testing when we were in Las Vegas with the Lacie rugged SSD Pro. I might be saying those words in the wrong order, but that's their version of, of these drives that we've been talking about here. But theirs is a Thunderbolt 3 drive, but the chipset they use falls back to USB 3. If it can't negotiate Thunderbolt. And so that's exactly what would happen. But with, say, this G drive and the OWC Envoy Pro EX, they just don't mount until you unplug the other device that's plugged in uh, to the other USB-C port on the MacBook Air. And then these devices mount. So I dug and I went and checked out the 16 inch MacBook Pro. Uh, the folks at Mac edge locally here, let me kind of go and play with their machines because they have lots of them. And I realized that this problem is far more likely to occur on a two port machine than a four port machine. And the reason for that, as I've done some digging here and talked to various little friends and birdies and all of that stuff is that, Say on my on on the MacBook Air, there is one Thunderbolt bus, okay, and the first device can get fifteen watts of power. The second device connected can get seven and a half. That's how the bus works. And these problems that we're talking about are these symptoms. I don't want to say it's a problem. These symptoms that we're talking about are a function of things that happen only when the device is on its own internal battery power. If it has external power, none of these uh, issues exist because there's power coming in. So it's very much related to power. So the first device can get 15 Watts. The second device can only get seven and a half. Um, this is why the second device generally cannot be negotiated at Thunderbolt because Thunderbolt, especially for an SSD is going to request, you know, like three amps, which is 15 watts, right? So, or close enough. So on, on, the, on the MacBook Air, which has one Thunderbolt bus, that's what happens. Now, the 16-inch the MacBook Pro and even the 2015 MacBook Pro, 2016 MacBook Pro, I think we checked this with too, uh, same thing, has four USB ports, or four Thunderbolt 3 ports, I should say, but they're split into two buses, one on either side of the Mac. However, power is shared amongst those. 
the best case is to split devices amongst buses. But if you don't, the way Apple has engineered these things, you can still get 15 watts on the second port that you plug something into, but not the third. So even though you could plug two, you know, Thunderbolt drives in on the left side of the MacBook Pro and it will take it because it's essentially borrowing power. It's better to say sharing power from, you know, what it would assign to the other bus. But the other bus now can only do seven and a half uh, on on the next on the third port that you plug into. So the 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 net of this is all very confusing because it leads to a very confusing user uh experience right because if you plug let's say you have a usb hub like a travel hub or a travel dock whatever you want to call it and then a, a thunderbolt drive like that's a, a realistic scenario that you could travel with if you plug the thunderbolt drive in first and then plug the usb hub in the thunderbolt drive gets its full power so it mounts as a thunderbolt drive the usb hub is sort of it's going to ask for more power in most cases because it knows it might need it for other devices you're about to connect, but it will negotiate down. So it will it will work, assuming you don't plug in anything, you know, downstream of that that's going to pull power. But if you plug the Thunderbolt drive in first, USB hub second, they both mount up exactly like you would expect. If you plug them in in reverse order, they don't. And it's just an idiosyncrasy of the way this works. Now, sometimes you will get a an error message saying this device is asking for more power than than you than you need that would happen in the case of like the g drive or the owc envoy pro ex the thunderbolt only drive but the lacy drive that is thunderbolt or usb you don't get that message because the drive says i want 15 watts and the system says i don't have it and so the drive says cool can i have seven and a half and it says yeah and it's like all right great i'll go usb for you which is a great user experience in the sense of mounting the drive, but not so great if you were expecting it to be at Thunderbolt speeds and you you don't test it the moment you plug in the drive, you might wind up, you know, with it running slower like you and I saw in Vegas when we tested the that drive that time. So the net of all this is that Apple actually has done quite a few very interesting things to attempt to give you the power that you need without setting you up for failure with like brownouts and, you know, protecting you against those things, which is good. The re reality of it is you need to take the devices that you're going to use, especially in a battery operated scenario and plug them in at home when you're not in that crunch and figure out what the right order is, the right devices are to use and learn where it works great and where you're going to run into these power related problems. Because as we were saying at the beginning of the show, USB-C creates a very interesting set of power demands. Uh, and that's just a reality of it. That's why we don't have, you know, a USB-C hub with, say, six USB-C ports on it. It's like, well, are each of them going to ask for seven and a half watts? And if so, what's that going to do upstream? Can you provide that? We don't know. Like, that's that's where this stuff gets really, really. And then you would say, well, that hub stinks. It, you know, it's no good because it can't provide the power that I need. It's like, well, it's not the hub's fault. It's upstream from that. So this is where it gets all very interesting. And like I said, I, I you know, it's but there you go. So my advice is take the devices that you have. Spend, you know, an hour on a Saturday afternoon. Plug them in. Use system information, uh, which is an app that you can launch. It's in the utilities folder in applications. Or if you hold down the option key and go to the Apple menu, you can launch it right from there. And look when you attach these things, look in the USB section, look in the Thunderbolt section and learn how your devices all interact with each other so that you can kind of just move forward and and have a good experience. Thoughts on that, John? You think I'm crazy? Wait, don't no, I actually confirmed question. this. Okay. I was like, oh, how can I confirm this? I don't have any Thunderbolt drives. Sure. I do. Okay. Target disk mode mm. is my Thunderbolt drive. <clears throat> and I had a different, um, I had a slightly different experience. So um, target disk mode uh, lets you mount your Mac as a hard drive on another Mac. 
And uh, there are two protocols that it uses. And so when you start up in target disk mode, it'll show you a Thunderbolt icon and a USB icon because you can do either one of those. Right. Um, here's the good news. When I put one of mine in target disk mode and then um, saw it mount on the other, and then I use that fancy cable that I told you about a couple of weeks ago. Yes. Um, yeah. It came up as Thunderbolt. Right. When okay. I looked in system info, but at 20 gigabits per second. Now, it's funny because that cable doesn't advertise itself as a Thunderbolt. It is. Okay. It, it's the first Thunderbolt connection I've ever seen. Now, if I plugged it in later, it would, it would connect via USB target disk mode and the disk would not mount. I would, it, it would prompt me for a password, but when I typed it in, it would, it would do the, nah, you know, like head shake thing. Interesting. So 20, so let's, 20 gigs could be a function of just the, the either device on either side, but it also, and I'm pulling this out of my head. So somebody please correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, and I'm pointing to all you folks in our chat room at live.macgeekab.com. Uh, Thunderbolt cables, Thunderbolt three cables can either be active or passive. And I believe active cables, they cost a little bit more, can pass 40 gigabytes per second and gigabits. Sorry. And um, passive past 20. So it's possible your cable is capable of doing passive Thunderbolt three. And I, oh. I, I, and I'm hoping somebody it's, is you know, it's going to check me on this. Um, I don't know. It's crazy. There's it, you know, that's the, that's the crazy part about all this. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 40 gigabytes, gigabits. Sorry. I don't want to keep saying gigabytes. I've been so good about that up until now. <laughs> bad, bad. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. All right. Passive Thunderbolt three, four. I'm, I'm confirming this here. Uh, and they say that active Thunderbolt cables generally can only be a half a meter. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Passive cables longer than 0 0.5 meters feature only 20 gigabits per second of connectivity. Whereas, oh. uh, yeah, that's the reason. Okay. Cause I yeah. think it's a three foot cable. Yeah, so it probably is a passive Thunderbolt 3 cable. I don't know. It seems like there might be some longer active cables, too, but but they, they'll cost a lot more. Uh, so it has something. I don't know. It, there's more to this. That we're going to have to get back to you on. Um, yeah, so there you go. Fun. But hopefully that helps. Really, the reality is, you know, because there's so much power, there's so much um, variance in the power requirements of the different devices that you can connect to these things. You just need to test it out before you're in that crunch situation and figure that out. So there you go. Um, it looks like there might be a Cal digit active Thunderbolt three cable that can do two meters. Now it's going to cost you 60 bucks to do this. But it does exist, so I will put this in the show notes, and uh, and we'll we'll go from there. So good, yeah. It's fun. I love this stuff. I, I mean, you know, kind of. I mean, I no, I do. It just it gets it gets crazy. Uh, I want to take a minute and talk about our next two sponsors before we go into some more cool stuff found in Quick Tips. How's that sound to you, John? Please do. All right. I'm happy to bring Jamf now back on board here into the Mac Geek Gab family as a sponsor because Jamf now makes it easy to set up, manage, and secure all of your Apple devices. Jamf now at jamf.com slash mgg is a mobile device management system and their security helps you sleep a little bit better at night, right? Because it can be set. You can use it to set on all of your mobile devices, all the devices you manage. You can set it to enforce passcodes and encryption. You can use it to remotely lock or wipe a device. And Jamf now ensures that you have the MDM security settings that you need so that all of your Apple devices and the information on them is untouchable just the way you want it. Right. You can place a device in lost mode. You can remote lock. You can remote wipe, as I said, from anywhere. 
from anywhere. As long as you've got a web browser, you are good to go so that you can focus on your business instead with no IT experience needed at all. And we have a deal because you're a Mac Geek Gab listener. I gave you that URL before, the jamf.com slash MGG, because you can start securing your business today, setting up your first three devices for free. And then you can add more, starting at just two bucks a month per device. So go create your free account today. What are you waiting for? Like there's, it's free. And the first three devices like are always free. It doesn't matter what three they are, right? The, 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 as long as you got three or less in there, it's free. And then more than three you pay for at starting at just two bucks a month. So go create your free account today at jamf.com slash MGG. That's J-A-M-F dot com slash MGG. Our thanks to Jamf now for sponsoring this podcast. BB Edit. Yeah, that's our next sponsor here. And it's a tool that's up and running on my Mac right now. I don't even have to look because I'm always running BB Edit. Whether I'm starting it from the command line, because you can do that. You can set it up so that when you're in the terminal, you can type BB Edit space and then a file name and it will open in BB Edit, that's way easier than editing something in the terminal. Have you ever tried that? Do you like VI? Some people do. I actually, like, I learned it. I don't, I don't want to say that I like it, but I learned it. It's fine. BB Edit's way easier to edit in, and it's way more powerful because I can do all this stuff, and it allows me to sort of have everything in one place. Not sort of. It allows me to have everything in one place. This is what I love about BB Edit. And then I can do all of my stuff. I can compare documents right there. I can see them on the screen. I can actually even sort of scroll through the, the very detailed changes, see what they are, apply changes back and forth between the two documents that I'm comparing. I can do multi-file find and replace. You ever have to do that? That's a pain in the neck, except it's not with BB Edit. You want to count the words in a document? Sure, no problem. And if you're doing some coding, well, even better, because BB Edit is totally built for that. That's actually what it was originally built for. But it does all these other things now, too, because it's so smooth at the way it does them all. Manipulating, editing, viewing, just dealing with all the text files in our lives. you got to check this out. You can go... Uh, you can actually go on the App Store if you want, because BB Edit is in the App Store. They have a brand new subscription model available there in the App Store, or you can just go get it at barebones.com. In fact, I think that that's where you should go. Go to barebones.com. You can download the full featured trial and you get all the features for 30 days. And then after 30 days, it, it sort of ratchets back. Uh, you can decide whether that's enough for you or if you need more. And if you need more, then you can either buy the perpetual license from barebones.com or you can buy it through the app store with your subscription. And then you can go to merch.barebones.com and, you know, wear your BB edit uh, spirit with pride like I do. So, Go check it out. Go to barebones.com and our thanks to Barebones and BB Edit for sponsoring this episode. Dave, I'm all about USB C. Okay. <clears throat> Same. Right, we, it's, um, it's great. I love this world that we live in. Yeah. So, anyway, so um, in one of my feeds, um, they posted a deal for uh, um, it's the Jarve PPS Wireless Exec PD 10,000 milliamp hour power bank with 10 watt wireless charging and Type C 18 watt power delivery. Well, what are you What are you talking about here, John? So anyway, so it's a battery. Micro USB is used to charge it. It has a USB A port for your old stuff, so you can charge other stuff. And then here's the cool part: it has a USB C port that can both let you charge it or charge other things so it goes both ways uh oh it's also a cheat charger so. nice wow that's cool and uh here's a link when i got it they they had like a, a manufacturer rebate i got it for like 22 bucks here um uh the price now is a little higher and actually the best price that i've seen is from b and h not amazon amazon you you'll pay 50 dollars retail okay so uh Get it from B and H if, if you want one. Yes, yeah, sounds but, like uh, a good idea. I thought it was pretty handy. That's pretty cool. Have you tried it yet with your MacBook Pro to see if it will power your MacBook Pro? Yes. 
Well, it, it will. Um, let me see what happens when I plug it in. Yes. Yeah. We'll say charging. OK. So if I plug it into the MacBook, it's like, oh, OK, you want me to charge this? So so it's smart enough to know that, yeah, the MacBook Pro shouldn't I, be charging it. <laughs> well, so that's an interesting thing. I have I haven't tested this one, but in a general sense, you know, I, like. I really like that we live in a world now where I can carry a battery with me that can, you know, top up my laptop. That's awesome. And I've tested lots of them. I've tested them from my charge. I've tested them from anchor. I've tested them from, I think life proof has one too. And there, my experience has been that they're all a little bit wonky and I'm not convinced it has anything to do with the power bank. I think it might be the max, but but I could be wrong about this. Right. But but it but the sometimes I plug it in and it's like, cool, I'm charging sometimes like my Mac says, cool, I'm charging. Sometimes I plug it in and nothing happens. It's as though it's not plugged in. Sometimes the uh, the Mac starts charging the power bank and other times it's this flip flop back and forth between the Mac charging versus the Mac being charged and it's it's not perfect is really what I've I've come to figure out. And so I just have to be really sort of conscientious about. All right, I'll look, I'll plug it in. It does my Mac start charging within the first whatever, five seconds or whatever. It might take a few seconds and it it depends. I find if the power bank has a button on it, sometimes hitting the button like the button that would would show you the, the charge level or something. That often puts it into powering mode. And it, and again, they're all sort of different, but it sort of just like I was saying in the last segment there, you, you kind of have to learn how to jigger things to make this, you know, USB C based power go the direction that you want it to go. But but um, so I I'm curious if you ever run into that with this one. It, you know, I've I've had them. Um, at first, I thought, honestly, I thought the life proof one that they had given me uh, to test out was bad. They sent me a new one because the anchor one that I was using worked out great. And then I realized, no, it was just luck of the draw. I just it just so happened that when I plugged the anchor one in, I had it in the right mode and my Mac was in the right mode. And, you know, I, I got lucky. And now that I've realized they're all a little bit it's you got to hold your mouth just right to get it to work. But it does work. Just know that it might take, you know, unplug it, push the button on it, plug it back in. Don't push the button, plug it back in. It just depends. So it's fun. Yeah. Yeah. This one, I have to press the button so that it'll recognize that there's a Qi device when I want to charge my phone. Okay. Yeah. There you um, go. Yep. Yep. Makes sense. Yeah. You know, I didn't, did it even come with a manual? I have to read the manual. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that. See if there are more modes that I don't know about. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Seth Sayer, Sayered? No. Seth shared. Easy for me to say. Uh, three quick tips with us. Really, they came from, uh, I think it's Matt Birchtree, I want to say, uh, but birchtree.me. And uh, it was a great little article that, that was essentially uh, Mr. Birchtree. And I'll, I'll, I'll figure out what his first name is. It's either Matt or Michael. I can't remember. Uh, it is Matt. Mo, sorry, not Matt Birchtree. His site is birchtree.com. It's Matt Birchler. So he had just gone around his office and sort of asked people to show him the cool things or what they knew. And uh, essentially, he went mining for quick tips, which is a great thing to do. We recommend everybody do this. And he came up with three. Uh, the first was that a lot of people didn't know how to know if you could scroll in the finder. And most folks said, well, to figure out if I can scroll in the finder or any app, I just attempt to scroll. And if it scrolls, then I know that I can. Well, that's not the best use of our time. So uh, my advice to everyone, and I do, this is very much a Dave centric point of view, go to system preferences, go to general, go to show scroll bars and change it to always. It does take up a little bit of space on the right side of your windows, but now you always know, hence the always, whether you can scroll and where you are in the scrolling. It's super handy. I find it I find it well worth spending that little, you know, whatever it is, 20 pixel uh, little bit on the side of my thing. Do you have that turned on on yours, John? 
I'm pretty sure I do. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's a handy little thing. So thank you for that, Seth. The next one was that he found that most people did not know that you could preview screenshots uh, or really many other files, most other files, I'll even say, uh, by hitting the space bar using what Apple calls quick look. And you can do this not just in the finder, but in file dialogues and things like that. I find it super handy if I need to attach an image to something like a screenshot or, you know, whatever. While I'm in that dialogue, you know, for it navigating to my folder and finding it, it's like, well, I can't tell by the little thumbnail if that's the image I want. So I just hit the space bar and boom, up it comes. So another great little tip. Thank you, Seth. And the third one, a lot of people did not know that you can right click on a single button mouse. Now, that's a bit of a lie because there if the mouse doesn't have a second button, you can't actually right click, but you can approximate the right click by holding down the control key and clicking to get that alternate menu or whatever else it was. So I know most of us probably have mice that, that have two buttons or have the you know magic sensors on them or whatever it is, but that is a handy thing to remember control click, especially in those moments where your mouse is sort of acting wonky and, or your trackpad and you can't get the two fingers to work the right way. Never forget control and click will give you that alternate menu. So thank you for those three, Seth. It's great stuff. And I put a link to um, that birchtree.me post as, about it as well. So. Good, John. Yes. Good? Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, oh, I figured one thing out about my new uh, MacBook Pro. Yeah, man. I didn't realize this yeah. is why you should read the manual. Um, apparently, this trackpad has force touch. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I didn't know that when oh, I first yeah. got it. Right. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah have, the other machine, older machine did not have that. Right. Have you played with uh, with Force Touch on it at all? Yeah. Okay. You know, like if you do it in the Finder and you hold down on something, it'll do a, a quick look. Yeah, that's right. That's another way to so do forth quick look. And so oh, on. oh, nice little quick tip. Very good. Cool. Cool. Uh, we have. Uh, I think we might be able to get through these. Scott asks us. Uh, he, he sent us a, a very panicked message, uh, which is fine. And he says, my business ended up at a location where it will take a month to get Internet service. I'm stuck. Everything in the world is online and I need connectivity. Ironically, there is a cell tower across the street, about 50 yards from my door. Are there companies that still offer MiFi type services or devices? I can't seem to find anything like it. What about a router that assumes the backhaul is a cellular network? Any help, advice, and sage words would be appreciated. Yes. He says, if I can't solve this problem, I'm screwed. I get you. I feel you. So um, the answer is all of the above is, is at your fingertips. The, um, there are, we looked, there are some MiFi type advices, essentially devices, not advices, uh, Essentially, a MiFi is a, a device that is a a hotspot that it connects to your uh, to the Internet via cellular. So the, I think Verizon was the first one to market the device that was called a MiFi, but it's just a portable hotspot. Essentially, of course, we may all find ourselves using these types of things if it turns out that 5G is better than, say, having a cable modem. We might have exactly that in our homes and not so portable. But the idea is that these exist and they do. They're somewhat pricey, especially for the scenario you're describing where you only need it for a month or, or two. Uh, but I think Verizon has one that you can buy for 50 bucks and then you just add service to it, you know, and you're good to go. You're paying for the service no matter which way you go with any of these solutions, obviously, obviously. So that's one way. The other way uh, is you could use your phone as a standalone hotspot. Or you could use an old phone as a standalone hotspot, right? If you have an old iPhone, as long as uh, you connect it to service that allows that, that would work. Uh, that would be fine. And also, um, you could get an old or inexpensive Android phone if you don't have an iPhone. If you've got a phone, then that you know it's essentially free if it's extra. But if you don't have a phone, Android phones can do this too. They have the same, you know, guts essentially. And so good to go. All right. So fine. Great. No problem. Um, or you mentioned routers. 
And Synology's routers, the RT2600AC and the RT1900AC, let you set up, they call it a second connection, but if you don't have the first, then it is the first. Uh, you can set up a second connection on a USB-based connectivity device. And this is built for exactly this scenario where you are pulling in the, uh, the internet via a cell signal. And the cool part about the way Synology does it is you can also set this up as your backup or to spread the load of the connection. You can configure that in the router. It's actually fairly straightforward. So you set this up and you can say, cool, uh, use my, you know, let's say cable modem or whatever, my Ethernet based Internet access uh, when that's available. But if and when that fails, immediately fall over and go with this cell signal. And then that way. You always have connectivity, even if there's some issue with the thing. So this might be the solution to head down for your business because you you always want to have connectivity. And so by setting this up now, it gets you through the next whatever, four to six weeks. And then you've got it as a backup. And they have a long list uh, on Synology's website about all the various devices that can be used for this. And there are some you know, uh, purpose built devices, but most of the things on the list, believe it or not, are Android and iPhones uh, because you can connect them via USB and they do this perfectly as long again, as you have service that allows it allows internet sharing. So, um, so that's, that's the way I would go with it. Uh, any thoughts on that, John? Um, if you're with Verizon, yes. this is a consideration. So, um, I use my phone as a hotspot and they have a feature called safety mode. Okay. Where if you exhaust your data, your LTE data, they'll throttle you to 3G until sure. your next billing period. Or you could just buy, do a one-time buy of as much data as you need. Right. So that could get pricey. Hmm. Yeah, that I'm makes not sense. Sure how much they sell data for. Yeah. What do you but, have? Um, do you have like a, a 15 gig a month limit on your unlimited plan or whatever of hotspot data? That's generally how those go. I, like, I do not have unlimited. Right. That's right. That's right. Of course. So the, so the plan that I got with this, so I had a two gig plan and that was, you know, for, for being going around town, that, that was plenty. And then they're like, Hey, you know, for five bucks more, we'll give you five gigs. And now they have the rewards program where you can add, a gig of data every month. So right now, and, sure. and they do rollover. So I'm up to, I think like nine. Got it. Um, which for me is, is plenty. That's great. That's good. That's good. Uh, but maybe not if you're going to be running your business totally on the hotspot. Yeah. Well, it depends on what he needs. If it's just for, you know, like credit card transactions and those sorts of things that might, be, that might be enough, but you're right. Like it depends on, on what he's got to do with it. So hopefully that helps Scott. Uh, Anand asks, he says, uh, I have been enviously been listening to many an episode where you've given listeners advice on networking and new homes or refurbs they're doing. I am now in the same boat. The house I bought is an old Victorian three story property around 3000 square feet. I want to run some sort of wired backhaul, especially for areas where there is multimedia. But then for the rest, it's mesh Wi-Fi that I am super excited to get my hands on. I have no current Wi-Fi setup to speak of. Uh, therefore, I'm feeling that I am starting from scratch on the Wi-Fi. Great. Other relevant tech is that I run a Synology NAS for files and access, etc. My main question is, which solution are you most impressed with and which is most manageable for people like me who are not into super granular configuration, but want to tweak and set up a good config? I want to set up home security tech, lighting, automation, locks, multimedia sharing, etc. What do you suggest? Okay, so there's two ways to go with this. The TLDR easy advice is that Eero works. It really does. It's it, it, they they're reliable. Uh, they're priced very fairly, I think, and it just works. Yes, they also happen to be a sponsor of the show, but we liked their stuff long before that happened. Uh, but you do like they the the sponsorship does allow that that code. I think if you go to eero.com slash mgg, and I'm just pulling this off my head, you get free overnight shipping, which is great. So consider that. But Eero really is like that's the one that that I sort of default to because I like the tech best. It has nothing to do with the sponsorship. That said, I, there are others that I that I like. You know, you're a Synology person. The Synology mesh has gotten way more reliable these days. So that might be something 
uh, worth considering here is is checking out the Synology mess. The nice part about that is you're already used to the way Synology's web interface works because of your disk station. And so you get some of that. You can buy just the Synology mesh units and use those as your router. Or you can buy, like I mentioned, you know, in the last question, like the RT2600 AC, use that as your router and then add Synology's mesh points to it. Um, those, you know, those come with a little more features than than the Eero. Quite frankly, they come with more features than any of the other consumer focused stuff. You know, you can do cloud station or drive on it where you essentially run your own Dropbox. You can hang a, a, a drive off of it and, and point your time machine backups at it. It can share your printers on the network. Uh, it can do lots. It can, the VPN engine in Synology's routers is the best VPN, like inbound VPN engine I've seen for that kind of thing. So so that's that's another way to go. And then there's Plume. Plume is always, you know, right there at the top of the list with with Eero and whomever else is at the top of the list. Synology has sort of floated there in in recent months. But um, Plume's doing cool things. Again, their management is super easy. And they've recently added this cool motion feature where it uses what it knows about the Plume access points connections with your other sort of fixed in place IoT devices and it builds, let's let's say a, a a map of your home. I don't want to use the word map. That's probably wrong. But it builds sort of a a a, 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 a fundamental knowledge about your home. And as you or other humans move through your home, you disrupt those Wi-Fi signals. And so it can know that there are people moving in your home because of those disruptions, which is pretty cool. And then you can say, well, don't worry about this. If I'm home and you flag yourself as a user and you say, look, if my watch or my iPhone is in the house, I'm home. Don't worry about it. Or you can do that with other family members as well. But then it can also alert you and say, like, hey, you know, there's motion in your home and none of the people that that you have flagged as OK or home. That's kind of an interesting thing. Um, so, you know, there's that. So that's my uh that's my thing. Eero's the easy answer for you. I'd probably say maybe check out Synology too. Um, but in a general sense, those are sort of the three that are that are floating to the top of my list. I mean, if you want to get geeky, it, you know, the you unify stuff from Ubiquity is awesome. Um, it's a little more requires a little more active management, I will say. But it's fun if you're into that. Otherwise, you know, maybe not so much. So there you go. But John, we have we have a little bit of time left. Eero just added HomeKit support. What does that mean? I think what it means. So if you go into the Eero app now, um, there's a button saying, hey, you want to add you want to make HomeKit and home aware of your Eero's? And it's like and at first when you asked me to do this, I'm like, well, you know, but I don't have any HomeKit devices. Well, as it turns out, I do. I just didn't know it yet. Okay. So first it brings you through a process where it's like, okay, I see this one. So it, it hands it over to the home app and then it's like, okay, I see this one. What room is it in? So you're, you're giving some, I, for my home environment wasn't set up because I wasn't using home kit, but now it is. Um, and then if you go within um, the home app, uh, you'll now see that it, it lists. Okay. I'm sorry. So first I did that. Then when I ran the home app, it's like, hey, you got an Apple TV. You want to make that your uh, your hub? And it's like, oh, yeah, OK, it is a home kit device. Uh -huh. So once you're done with that whole operation now, what happens is that so if I go into the home section of the home app, it has two uh, two categories listed here. Hubs and bridges. Oh, well, what's the hub and bridge? Oh, duh, it's my Apple TV. And then it has a listing of Wi-Fi network and routers. Isn't that neat? And it shows each one of them, but then here's the important part. So it's like, why would you want to do this? Is that there's a slider here that says HomeKit Accessory Security. Okay. Now, in my case, in my case though, I uh, I got to get more HomeKit devices because the uh, from my understanding is that this HomeKit security restricts what services and where your devices can go. And I don't think I have enough things yet in order to really take advantage of that or see that it's happening. OK, that makes sense. All right. So, yeah, as I was looking, because I at the moment I'm not running I'm running Eero for my Wi-Fi, not 
but I'm running it in bridge mode, which means I can't use HomeKit because it's not my router at the moment. But it, as I understand it, what you just said, they're, they're granular. Uh, there's three options, right? You, a device can be restricted to only communicate within the home, which means it's only talking to your Apple devices when you're at home. But that can mean that the device is talking to your Apple TV, which is your HomeKit hub. And then that can talk out to the Internet. And so you can control things from your phone when you're not at home because your Apple TV is is doing that. But it it from a security standpoint, it keeps those IOT devices in your home from talking out of the home. And that's good. Number two is what they call automatic, where the router allows your IOT accessories to connect only to uh, an automatically updated list that the manufacturer and, and Eero, I guess, you know, kind of agree upon. So that's good. So if your device gets hacked, it keeps it from, you know, becoming a bot or something. And then, of course, there's no restriction. You can, your device can do what it was able to do yesterday. So that's pretty good. I, I, I that's I, like to me, that's handy. I like that. That's good. Cool. Yeah. And they're, they're, the other thing that lists here is so now i have just a single icon which is just for the apple tv sure um oh i'm sorry no in the home section so here's the other thing in the home section now it, it's aware of the fact that i now have speakers and tvs and it's like hey what level of access do you want to give to this uh -huh. and there's everyone anyone on the same network and only people sharing this home so mm. if i wanted to i could prevent or allow you or whoever visits here uh, that becomes part of my home setup which you're not part of my home yet right no that's right no but that's that's not related to the Eero thing that what you're seeing there with your speakers is a <laughs> is part of home kit and yes, uh, yes. airplay too yeah exactly yep yep that's awesome cool well thanks for uh thanks for taking us through that that's good that is all we have um we are recording this early uh we're recording this on friday the 13th uh, largely because that was our schedule because I was going to travel uh, to South by Southwest on the 14th for to Austin for South by Southwest. That's not happening, needless to say. Uh, but we did just hear in the chat room, uh, I think it was Brian Monroe and several other people were talking about it, that WWDC is happening virtually in an online format this year. So we'll put a link to that. But by the time you hear this episode... Uh, you probably already heard that, but if you haven't, then, then there you go. And, and there's a link in there. So, uh, so WWDC 2020 will be online in June. So there you go. Thanks. Thanks to everybody in the chat room at live.macgeekab.com for, uh, for sharing that and for helping out with everything for, uh, in the show. And thanks. Yeah. Brian Rowe and, and Mac Vader and Dave Ginsburg and, who else has been talking here in the chat room and iChart Radio. Cool. So thanks, everybody. And thanks to all of you who were here on kind of a weird day, uh, an off-cycle day. It's not a weird day, at least not yet. <laughs> Feels normal so far, but we get our weekend, John, so that's cool, which is nice. Nice little bonus. Yeah. yeah. There's nowhere to go. They, they shut everything off in my town. I know. I know. They shut everything off here, too. Well, hopefully, hopefully we can, you know, kind of keep this thing contained and, and it'll it'll feel like we overreacted and maybe we did. Maybe we didn't. And, and maybe that's not so bad. So I don't know. It's yeah. hard to know. It was crazy yesterday. It was yeah. like end times at the, uh, at oh, the yeah. supermarket and that they were out of the usual things when people start panicking. You know, almost all the bread was gone. Uh, toilet. Paper. It's like, why, why are people buying all the toilet? paper? I, I will tell you this. I, you know, I, I hesitated. I, I said there's some cool stuff found that I wanted to add in but I didn't really want to detour us. But since we're here, I stopped using toilet paper six years ago, and it was one of the best decisions I ever made. Now, before you start thinking weird Ooh. thoughts, uh, right, there yeah. you go. <laughs> um, I installed these like $30 bidet attachments to all our toilet seats in the house. It's so much better. I, I, I don't want to get, you know, gross about this, but I, I will say a thing. If I pick up poop with my hand... I don't just wipe it off with a dry piece of paper and go on with my day. That's all I'm going to say. And so the bidet allows me to sort of embody that concept, if you will. Uh, it's very good. It's very good. I like it. It's like 30 bucks. It took like 20 minutes to install each of them. I'll find they, the ones that I bought six years ago don't exist anymore because these are sort of, you know, commodity items. But um, 
but uh, but they've lasted and I haven't needed to buy new ones. But I'll find something similar and I'll put it in the show notes for anybody. And and I'm sorry that we got here, but maybe it's helpful to everyone. So, you know, that's what we do. We try to learn new things. Uh, you, certainly you could get I think they have like crazy ones that are like 250 bucks with the dryer and the heater and the, all that stuff. I don't have those, but, you know, there you go. They work. It's great. I always joke, but it's not a joke that they are the thing that I miss most second only to missing my family when I travel. So there you go. It is TMI. It's time to move on. Thank you for that. Ah, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to all of our sponsors for the episode, of course, uh, barebones.com, jamf.com slash MGG. Uh, Lino.com slash MGG and LegalZoom.com. So thanks to all of them. Thanks to all of you. Thanks to all of our premium listeners. Uh, we will go through that list next week. I, we got running late today and had a lot of stuff to go through. So I, I kind of reprioritized and jiggered. Uh, but thanks to all of you for allowing us to be able to do this. Thanks for all of your questions. Thanks for all of your tips. And uh, that's uh, that's what I have. That's what I got, John. What else? What else do you have? Anything? Anything? Uh, there's stuff on the way. I'm okay. Delivery today. I wonder what it is. Uh, oh, maybe that that one thing or the other thing. Oh yeah, could be. Or or all the other stuff. I don't know. 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 Uh, I don't know, John. It's all the craziness. It's all the craziness. Uh, yeah. All right. Well, we will uh, We will see you next week. It's what we're going to do because we podcast and it's, it's what we get to do from here. So uh, it's cool. Right, thank goodness. I don't know what else I would do. I don't know. It's good. Are you sure? You can't think I, of anything? Oh, uh, yeah. Actually, I can think of one thing. And, you know, I can think of when we were at Mac Tech and we all shared a moment in the same room together. And I really hope that we all get to get together again if it's not this year. But, but you know, like we got to prioritize getting back to a point where we uh, are are actually having human human contact because it's really good. So I will share this particular moment from Mac Tech, which uh, not Mac Tech. Why did I say Mac Tech? Mac Stock. When we got to do this in person, hopefully we get to do it again someday. Uh, because not only was it a beautiful little moment, but it's some fantastic advice that all of the folks that attended in person at Mac Stock got to share, and we will share it again here. Don't get caught. Made up.